Skeptical Inquirer presents. Yay! I'm Jim Underdown, your co-host, and that's Kenny Bill, your other co-host. There you go. <laughs> we, we, have e- we have equal status uh, wow. tonight. We're not going to, there's nobody in charge. So does that mean I'm moving up or did you move down? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. <laughs> you came down to my level. <laughs> Either one's believable. Um <laughs> Well, let's sort of <clears throat> let's start out with just introducing each other, just so so you know, you people at home know or wherever you are. You don't have to be right. home. Yeah. Um, it's St. Patty's Day. Maybe you're in the middle of something important. Yes, like celebrating. Watching, watching this. <laughs> yeah, what could be yeah. more celebrating important while that? watching us? <laughs> but just so you know who we are and where we're coming from, uh, Kenny Biddle is a regular columnist for Skeptical Inquirer magazine. Uh, he hosts the video series, Ghosts in the Machine, and he's also hosts two live stream shows every week. I'll let him mention exactly how to get in touch with those. Uh, and I mean, that's a lot going on. And I have a little known pa- fact about Kenny Biddle, and that is in his basement, at an undisclosed location, he's got a museum of allegedly, capital A, allegedly haunted items. And he uses these things to explain some of the investigations and how tests, how to test certain ideas and stuff. But, you know, as I was reading that, Kenny, it, it sounds like a superhero movie I, I, I saw. Wasn't there like in Shattered? What was that movie? Oh, superhero movie with haunted Uh, uh, unbreakable. No, not unbreakable. Oh, unbreakable. Well, unbreakable was, yeah, that was um, Bruce Willis. No, there was another one. There was one where somebody had this like room of horrors or something, and they there was there was like a devil or a spirit or something. Maybe it was a a, a second or oh who knows i can't this remember. sounds like a b movie that i watch at like 2 a.m yeah. <laughs> yeah. but anyway kenny has a real version of that it's not fake it's real except for the haunting part yes and then we have jim underdown who is the executive director for the center of inquiry west in los angeles and the chair and founder of the center for inquiry investigations group um and the little known fact i can't wait to ask you about this is that apparently you wrestled a bear. So I, was th- is this like a big teddy bear or was this a real bear? No, it was a live, uh, uh, what, he was brown, but I don't know if it was a brown bear. I think black bears can be brown actually. Um, it was at the International Amphitheater in 1979 at the uh, Sports and leisure, leisure Show. Victor the Wrestling Bear would come there every year and it was a, like a $500 prize if you could pin him. And I talked the guy into wrestling him one year. And I actually, I stuck my head in his side. Well, first of all, I tried to throw him like a judo throw. <laughs> and it was like, no, what are you doing? Okay. Are we you talking know? like a small baby bear or like? A- it was like probably six or seven feet tall when he was... <laughs> Damn, Jim. Yeah. And, he, you know, maybe three or 400 pounds, something like that. Wow. Um, no, he was strong because after I tried my ridiculous attempt at uh, judo flipping him, uh, I jumped down and went around to the side of him and I stuck my head in his side and picked up on his front leg and his back leg. And I drove and drove and picked and, and he went over and the crowd was like, ah because I was the first one who knocked him over in all the attempts but then the bear is on his back and he's like "Eh, I don't think I like this and he (laughs) just threw me away like a piece of paper and that was about the end of it wow that's pretty cool that's something I would love to do I want to do that now like now that I hear it I want to try that yeah my wife would say no but I'll do it anyway. Well, and I'll give you one hint too. This bear, he had a he had a muzzle on, but um, the muzzle was old and it was loose. 
And when I had him, I had him under my, my his head under my arm uh, for a second, and he started to nibble on my one of my love handles, <laughs> and uh, I was like, "Hey, you know, you need to tighten this muzzle." Open. <laughs> I know the PETA people aren't digging this at all. But, <laughs> Um, anyway, it was an interesting experience. Very cool. Very cool. So <clears throat> we'll talk a little bit about what we each do in our respective quests to be good skeptics. And then uh, we'll tell a couple stories and then we'll open up for questions in a little while. So um, what is it? I mean, what is your thing? What do you spend your skeptic time doing <laughs> my skeptic time yeah. that's good I, I need to put that like on a light <laughs> neon light <laughs> over my door and be like skeptic time leave me alone <laughs> so basically I, I guess i to sum it up i like to solve mysteries i really do and and that's it doesn't have to, like ghosts and hauntings and curses and stuff and that's usually what i dig into but i delve into other things i look into psychics i look into missing persons um once in a while and that actually ties in with a case we'll talk about later with a with a psychic with two psychics um but i also like looking at photographs and videos and trying to figure out how weird or strange anom anomalies appear on them um and i and i take this stuff i, I also also take uh ghost hunting gadgets apart so all the stuff you see on the tv uh shows the reality shows the reality shows when they're going around saying oh look we detected something or a ghost is communicating with us i buy that stuff and or, or sometimes i get it donated to me and i take it apart and i figure out exactly what is inside of it and how it works and i demonstrate what can also make it go off other than an alleged ghost which most of the time it's a walkie-talkie i don't know those things are <laughs> magic um but then i take those investigations I write them up or now I, I have the opportunity now to do videos, which is it's such such a wider and, more, and broader range um, to teach with. And that's what I do. I teach uh, critical thinking skills, why skepticism is important, why science is actually cool. You know, we can have fun with it. And it's that's basically what I do. I, I, I take those experiences and say, well, this is what I do. Come with me. Share with me. And, and I found that over the years, like that's the best way to do it. When you can get, when you can not just talk at people, but if you can speak with them, have a conversation with them, explain yourself, and then also not only demonstrate it for them, but get them to demonstrate it with you. Like get their hands on, on, on the gadget and see what, what happens or how you can manipulate it. It's so much better. You see that light bulb go on, go on. And I mean, that to me is, that's, that's amazing. I mean, that's almost as cool as solving the mystery myself. Yeah, and that you could walk people into sort of a better understanding of, yeah. of how they came to their belief in the first place. Yeah. Well, I know we, I, we love you particularly because, I mean, people send us videos all the time and sometimes there is there's there is weird stuff happening on the video and it's not always apparent to the lay observer what right. is going on and you look at that stuff and come to some conclusions often and that that's part of it i mean that, that's and, and this is getting more into like my origin story but i i read everything i can on photography and video i i do video editing so I, I see the tricks. I, I mean, um, um, Captain Disillusion, he is like a mentor to me because that guy, if you ever watch his YouTube channel, he is amazing with video effects and breaking down. And I've learned so much from him, but I can apply that to what I see and what, like what you guys send me and what other groups send me and say, hey, you know what? Let, let me walk you through it. And it's just when you can do that, when you can walk someone through it and do it in a polite manner and and with them, not not trying to show them up or try to be like, I know everything and you don't know anything. When you avoid that attitude and just be nice about it, it's people are really receptive and they open up to you. And now I'm asked. I, I get invited to paranormal conferences. I get invited to speak at paranormal groups to, to share what I know. And I mean, I think that says a lot about how I approach it. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I, uh, I am in awe of your ability to talk to believers. <laughs> so what do you do? Let's switch it. Let's put the spotlight on you. What do you do? Well, I run the Center for Inquiry Investigations Group, formerly known as the Independent Investigations Group. We've been around since January of 2000. And we do two, we have two major thrusts. The first is investigating extraordinary claims. So we've gone out like you do and just, you got to show up at these places and you got to try to figure out what's doing and or try to figure out what's happening. But we, all, we also test people who say they have extraordinary abilities, particularly paranormal abilities. We currently have a $250,000 prize for anyone who can prove paranormal ability under controlled testing conditions. So we get calls and uh, applications every week from all over the world, from people who I, I think for the most part are completely legitimately convinced that they have some sort of superpower. And some of them are kind of lame superpowers. We'll talk <laughs> about that later. It's not like, I can make the earth stop or turn time back or anything like that. Um, but nevertheless, they would qualify as, as a superpower. So, so yeah, we spent a lot of time testing these people and uh, we may even have a test coming up this week. You know, oh. a lot of the people say they're going to come and they don't show up. So that's pretty common, but we'll see what happens. So on average, how many would you say you get a week? How many requests or applications? I would say something like three a week. Wow. Three a week. So we have a dedicated team. We call our first responders, fantastic, knowledgeable volunteers who are sort of intake counselors for people. And some of the people do need counseling. Let's be clear mm -hmm. about that. But they, they, their job, their first responders job is to uh, funnel the, the claim into a testable claim. Um, because a lot of people just say, you can hear my thoughts right now. And we say, no, we can't. And they say, yes, you can. And no, you know, it just <laughs> never ends. Um, so we figure out something that's actually testable and then, um, you know, go on and on. If they're in a different place, we try to line up uh, some of our sister groups with them, or uh, we figure out if it can be done over online via Zoom or Skype or something and and like that. That's cool. I, I, I love watching because you've you've put videos up on, on the website and I've loved watching them. And I mean I remember one of the first workshops I went to at, at the first Psycon where I was total newbie. I was just you know starstruck about everything and, and I attended a workshop that you did talking about your your investigations, your testing. And I was like this is awesome. I want to do this. I I I definitely want to do this for the rest of my life. <laughs> this is just fun. Well, so. we, we certainly meet interesting people. And, um, but I got to say some of these tests, some of them take a long time and it gets a little tedious. You have, it, it gave me a real appreciation for regular scientists, you know, who go through years of trials and experimentation to, to try to see if there's an effect some of these things have taken hours to do a single test wow so wow cool um, all right well let's 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 dive into that that background and origin story a little bit how did you get into this what what led you to your current state so i'm, I'm going to make this as short as possible <laughs> i'm going to run through i'm going to give you the cliff notes version so basically in 1997 that's the year I got married um, and we bought ourselves a computer because that was like, that was our wedding gift to each other. And this new thing called the World Wide Web was <laughs> just, you know, made available to all of us um, little people. And I was, I was amazed, you know, and I joined a ghost hunting group because I grew up believing in all of that stuff. I grew up in a Catholic household. I grew up believing, uh, like watching In Search Of and Unsolved Mysteries. So all that, I took it all. So I was a ghost hunter for many years. And then around 2007 or so, I started doubting. 
uh, what I was doing. And the reason I was doubting it, because you always read like, oh, seeing an apparition is so rare. It's like, you know, nobody gets to see it, only a select few, and then capturing it was so rare. Yet everybody was freaking getting one. Like every group, every individual going out, they go out for a weekend, boom, they got all these pictures and video and, and stuff. And I'm like, why? Why is this happening? So I went down a rabbit hole of learning photography and, and just went crazy with it. And I like now I have two bookshelves um, over here, just nothing but photography books. And I've read through them all and I've tried everything. I wrote a book called um, Orbs of Dust. Now, don't get excited. You can't get this because it was I, I'm so poor that I printed everything out myself and I actually stapled them together with, with a couple other people and we sold them at conferences. And it was all about photographs and how to get these anomalies, orbs and ecto and apparitions and, and talking about double exposures and all this stuff. So I was on the path of skepticism. I was going over to the dark side, <laughs> if you will. And a friend of mine um, sent that book to Ben Rafford and uh, he contacted me and he liked it. He couldn't write a review about it because it wasn't actually like an officially published book. But he liked it and he, he talked about it a little bit. And then he asked if I would write something for Skeptical Briefs, which was the newsletter of Skeptical Inquirer. Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll try. And that's, that's when I realized how hard this is. Um, because before, as a ghost hunter, you just write whatever crap you want. <laughs> and there's no one checking you. No editing, you know? yeah. Nothing. Nobody cares. It's just like, oh, yeah, I believe that too. Boom. Then I realized, wow, references, what are they? <laughs> um, <laughs> learned all about that, learned about, you know, making sure I knew what I was doing, learned about replication, learned about um, proper methods. And honestly, Ben was a real good mentor with that. Um, he really, he, he, my first article went through maybe 10 revisions um, as I learned. And after that, I started doing a little bit more. Barry Carr, I think, reached out to me and said, you know, you can write a couple more things. You can start submitting art articles if you want. And I was like, awesome. You know, I'll, I'll do that. And then he invited me out to PsyCon to, to speak and do a workshop. And I was like, holy crap. <laughs> I, I got to talk in front of people. And then I realized how much of a different crowd skeptics are <laughs> than ghost hunters. Because oh, yeah. they didn't laugh at the same jokes. <laughs> <laughs> and that was made me nervous. But it, it made me a better person. So I learned more and now I, I was offered a column. So I do a regular column for Skeptical Wire. I do the Ghosts and Machine videos. I've been out to PsyCon four times now. Um, and that's, that's where I am today. I just, I had this uh, tremendous opportunity to speak at different groups and share what I've learned. And it makes, it excites me because I was a total loser in school. Total loser. I didn't pay attention to anything. I didn't care if I failed or not. And now I got bit by the bug. I just, I cannot stop learning. I love learning. And this, this job, this part-time job gives me that opportunity and pays yeah. So <laughs> bonus. <laughs> so yeah, it is. what about you? Man? Oh, you have any questions? No, no. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, well, Let's start will, on yeah. Then. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I was, I don't think I was as deep of a believer maybe as you were or excited about it, but I thought we had been visited by aliens. I, I read Eric Von Donneken's books, uh, Chariots of the Gods. I actually went to see him speak once in Naperville, Illinois. I have all those books. <laughs> we, we have. My shop too, yeah. Uh, you know, it's compelling if you don't, if, if you don't know better, it's, it's really interesting. And I know he sold millions of books. Um, and then, you know, other stuff like um, psychic powers and clairvoyance and some of those things that there were even books that pr proposed to teach you how to do that stuff. And I, wow. I was yeah. into that and I was trying to like, you know, I'd try to pick out which elevator was going to open and <laughs> stuff like that. And then I started reading Skeptical Inquirer magazine and because they were, they were so in depth about it and, you know, so detailed about how your mind goes to here and why people believe this and what's really going on the, the, the science behind it 
And I'm like, what an idiot. I was, I'm wrong about everything, all that stuff. Oh, yeah. So then, I mean, the more you just start drinking all that stuff and it's like, wow, it's, it's, you start understanding how fallible human beings are and how many different ways there are to get wrong what you see and what you think you're experiencing. Right. And even though it's, it feels legit and, you know, most people who hold these beliefs are and, and tell these stories, most of them are completely honest about what's going on. It really is just a matter of not understanding either how their own brain works or how the outside world works or how a camera works or mm -hmm. whatever is going on to understand what happened. And it just erases the entire category of the paranormal or the supernatural. So right. uh, yeah, it's not kind of like you, then you even get more jazzed about, you know, the real explanations are more interesting than the, the ghost stories. Yeah, I mean, I, I went from ghost hunter kind of thing to the Scooby-Doo gang. You know, because that, that's what I, and I love it. I love it. Totally check it out. There you go. The whole gang right there. Wow. And, and that's, that, that, you just put that on today. That's legit. <laughs> it's, it's been there for a little bit more than a day. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. But yeah, I mean, I, that's, I love it. Okay. It, All it, right. So now the, 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 it, one more important question here is why you kind of touched on it a little bit, but I mean, What's the point of all this? What's the point? That's a good question. And I get that a lot. And, and honestly, I get that question more from angry people that, that are pissed off because I investigate something and I don't believe it. Like, I don't believe it outright. So they're like, why, why do you even bother? And the reason I bother is because, one, I'm totally interested in it. I want to know the truth. I don't want to just, I don't want to deceive myself. I don't want to fool myself anymore because I did that for years. I, I didn't look any further than what I wanted to see. And now I do. Now I want to get to the, the bottom of it. The second reason is that I want to help other people understand. And that has grown over the years where I do dive so far into it. I learn everything I can and I can understand it. I replicate it. I spend hours and sleepless nights replicating pictures and videos and experiences just so I can understand how it happened and then explain it to people that I do have friends and people that I don't know all around the world come to me and ask either through email or chat or in person at conferences ask like what can you tell me about this and when I go through the whole explanation they they love it they're they you see the light bulb going you see the relief I mean the, the I told one person, so I recently put out the video about uh, the Dybbuk box, which is supposed to be the most haunted object in the world. And at a conference, a paranormal conference, a woman came up to me and she told me a story about how when she touched it in the museum, a week later, her son committed suicide. And she blamed herself for that because the box has this reputation for being cursed and she thought it was her fault. And she came up to me because I have a I have a bill, like I'm not a billboard, but a big display that goes through the entire story of the hoax of the Dybbuk box. And she asked me about it and I explained it to her. And once I did, she, she started crying and she was so relieved to, to find out all the information, to find out that the guy that made the story up admitted that he made the story up and then realized that it wasn't her fault. And it's moments like that. You want to know why I do it? That's why I do it. Because yeah, I just gave that woman peace. You took a huge weight off her shoulders. Yeah. And, and it, it's just, I love doing that. I love being able to interact with people. And it's just, it's so much fun. <laughs> I can't tell you how much fun it is. I really can't explain it. I get so juiced, so worked up when I'm on a case and I'm figuring out clues. And I'm, they're all, the pieces of the puzzle are starting to come together. I love it. I absolutely love it. So why do you do it? Why do you put up with all the people? And I know some of the crap that you put up with. So why do you do it? 
Well, first of all, I'm I'm paid an extraordinary amount of money. Um, oh, are you hired? <laughs> I hate to. <laughs> I'll pay you out of my salary. How's that? Mm. Okay. Uh, no, that is obviously yeah, not why. <laughs> no, I've always got your back. Don't worry. Um, thank you. Uh, no, I mean, I, I don't know if it's, I, I've been reading about these scientists. I've been reading about, you know, everyone from sort of the beginning times of science, like Galileo and, and Isaac Newton and all these people who just, they, they zero in on trying to understand the universe and really go, go hard and deep into how things work. And I think that's a lot of it. And, and once you start, you get this body of knowledge where you see a, a whole panoply of different claims and you understand how all of them work it's like watching and it's like magicians going to a magic show the pen and teller know have a pretty good idea of probably about how most magic tricks are done at least in a, in its category sense so you know just having the same curiosity as you do and and wanting to understand what's happening and then to step back a little bit and sort of understand that Geez, this this stuff is all bull. It's all bull. It 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 makes me kind of mad that you know these are the psychics and the faith healers and these are sometimes multi million and even billion dollar industries. Uh, the whole thing with uh, uh, genetically modified foods and stuff like that. People are making money off off of that for the wrong reason so it just it's sort of disturbing to me that even though humanity is at this point where we know a fair amount about the universe especially compared to even 100 or 200 years ago we're way advanced yet the masses of people are still hooked into these dumb beliefs and i think it's an incumbent upon people like us if we can, to put a dent in, in some of these beliefs. And some of that stuff, I think, you know, the, the reward we get is a slightly more informed public. So when at times for, it comes time for either their own personal decisions, like whether to see a doctor or a faith healer, or when it comes to public decisions, like do we fund the NIH or the CDC, people are saying, yeah, this is obvious. You know, we, we should be electing people and spending our collective resources on understanding these things. So right. um, real scientists don't spend their time on, you know, people who say they can uh, make a light brighter with their own mind. Um, so we do it and sort of represent the, uh, a little bit more credentialed uh, world of science. You know what? I think another thing that, that I think both of us do is that people have an interest in this. So when you talk about fringe topics, flat earthers, hauntings, UFOs, cryptids, what, what have you, even though it's not the, like the big problems of the world, people have this strong interest in it and it grabs their attention. It grabbed my attention when I was younger. And if you can use this to sneak in critical thinking <laughs> skills and, and teach them how you know, to think better rather than just what to think, then by all means, I think use it. Use that interest. Oh, yeah. So yeah. I, that's, why, that's another reason why I do it. Yeah. Yeah, I wish I had a nickel for every dinner party I've ruined. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> someone said oh yeah i have a friend who's a psych and i'm like no you don't you do not and and if you do and that was one of the reasons why we started the group because i wanted to be able to say you know what I'm, I'm not even gonna have this discussion here's my card there's a quarter million dollars if your neighbor can show up and and prove it you know under a real test condition so 
We don't have to have a stupid argument and ruin the dinner party. You can just have them show up. And by the way, you get five grand as a uh, for a finder's fee if your neighbor passes. Yes, and I've done that plenty of times. Every time I'm challenged on some kind of superpower, and trust me, I mean, if you look around my room, you can tell I'm in the, the superheroes and comic books too. So if you tell me you have a superpower, Jim Underdown is the first person I think of. And I said, you know what? Here you go. Here's the link. Tell them I sent you. Please make sure it's B-I-D-D-L-E, fiddle. Tell them I sent you because I get five grand if you win. Yeah. I mean, I don't expect that money at all, but No, still. don't, don't, yeah, don't run a credit card up, but yes, you're <laughs> smart. Um, yeah. Okay, let's, um, let's talk about a, we, we, we already burned up half of the time already. Um, I thought we would talk about like a couple of cases real quick. What's it, what was your biggest, hardest case? Like, like what took the most effort? Talk about one of those. Wow. Okay. One of them. There's been a, there's been a few. So I guess, I guess I'm going to talk about the one that actually like made me angry. Um, and this was, this was actually a challenge from Ben Rapper. Um, he does a, a podcast called uh, scoring the strange. And for one night he sent me a message and his other co-hosts and said, Hey, you know, it might be cool to follow a missing, missing persons case that had psychics attached to it that were giving advice or publicly giving advice. And we follow it in real time. And I was like, yeah, you know, I've been, I, I, I would like to do this because that, that would be interesting. I want to see what they're saying and, and if it helps the case or, you know, if they're taking from headlines that just came out in this day, like we get information like that up to the minute. So I took the challenge on and, the three of us, me, Ben, and Celestia Ward, we took, we each took a case, and I took a case of a, a local uh, young lady called Stephanie uh, Pars, and so I was followed that, and the story was basically, it started out where Stephanie went to, of all things, a psychic show. So she went to a psychic show one night with her mom and family, it was a girl's night, and she went to see, um, I, I believe the psychic's name was Cindy Kaza. And yeah, Cindy Kaza. This medium, psychic medium, says that she can not only talk to dead people, but she can also see the past, present, and future of people around her. <clears throat> After that show, Stephanie was never seen again. Oh, wow. So that pissed me off immediately because this psychic who makes buku bucks selling out shows that claims that she can see the future had someone in her audience that was going to and this is a, a depressing spoiler going to die she was going to die later that night and this psychic blew it totally blew it uh so i did follow the case because she was still missing at the time i i took on the case and uh, one of the harder things was that I actually took part in one of the searches um, because it had been some time, a couple of weeks, and this, the search changed from trying to find her alive to trying just to find her. And so I went and I actually met her family and I went on one of the searches. They gridded out fields um, in New Jersey and we walked in a line. And, you know, just like you see on TV, there was probably about a hundred of us and we all got into a line about three four feet apart and we walked through the woods um and then we went to another spot walked through the woods and that was that was strange for me because i was i, I was an emt emergency medical technician for several years so i i'm not a stranger to a dead body but the thought of walking up on this young lady was kind of it made me nervous you know, and, and all the things that were going through my head and like, what if I find her and I'm the one that has to tell the family and then see what happens. So anyway, during this, I did find another psychic that was giving uh, on her YouTube channel, giving all these predictions about where um, the young lady was, where the police could find her. And I wrote it all down. I, I wrote an article for Skeptical Inquirer about it and detailed all of her predictions and not one of them was right 
every one of them was wrong. And it demonstrated that if she called the police or if the police followed what this second psychic was saying, they would have been in a completely wrong place. Because when I did the search, the day I did the search, an hour after I, was, I left, they found her. And it was in a completely different spot. Mm -hmm. um, none of the details lined up, nothing at all. And it was just, it was heartbreaking because like, this is the kind of shit that you see. I'm sorry, I don't know if I'm going to curse. Um, but this is the kind of crap that you see from these psychics that try to make a high profile, like celebrity status for themselves, where they're giving these general predictions and trying to seem like they're, they're right on point or, or correct, or, hey, listen to me. And all they do is take time and resources away from legitimate searches. And it angered me so much. Um, yeah, I mean, do you think someone might have wanted a tip on where to be on 9-11, 2001? Exactly. You know, that have been a help to anybody? Yeah. You know, like, hey, in press conference, nobody go to work today. Yeah. If you work in these towers, go. Don't get on a plane. Home. Yeah, exactly. Something, but no, we don't get that. Wow. Instead, we get people that charge fifty, sixty dollars for a half hour session, you know, and they make money hand over fist all day for for shelling out piles of of crap. Yeah. Uh, uh, all right, switching it back to you because now I'm oh now I'm angry. Um, <laughs> Blood pressure's up. Smash. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to pass it to you. What's, what's your most, I guess, difficult time effort case that you want? So, on? yeah, our, our most gigantic case over the years took a few years um, over the course of the investigation. And it started out when we found out that the, the California Board of Registered Nurses or nursing uh, requires their uh, their members to take continuing education units and you have to get a certain amount every year or every two years whatever it was and we found out one of the courses being offered to licensed nurses was therapeutic touch and that therapeutic touch for those who don't know is the alleged and I have to I have to pantomime this the alleged manipulation of an alleged energy field that allegedly surrounds a human body so you don't actually touch anyone the belief is that if your energy field is out of whack that's what's making you sick or whatever your problem is then you can have some practitioner come by and wave their hands above you and cure you of whatever disease you have just like that just like the pope <laughs> only got to use 10 fingers not just two so we heard about, we heard about this <clears throat> and we went to one of the board meetings the board meets around the state a few times a year and i use the public address uh period to say hey i don't know if you know this but somebody's teaching therapeutic touch to your nurses your educated very valuable you know, real legitimate uh, healthcare workers. They're teaching this to them. And I thought, you know, they would say, oh my God, you know, run to the books and get, get rid of them. And no way. They, they kind of furled their brows at us and they said, uh, well, you know, we don't think that's uh, against the rules. And, and I, I almost didn't know what to say because I thought they would be upset about it. So the next time, you know, we went there more prepared and I had all this information about what therapeutic touch was, how it defies the laws of physics and everything else and pass that out. And they still fought us. And I was like, why are you fighting us? And they started pointing to parts in the, 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 the manual, the nursing manual, that when we went and looked it up, and it was very hard to find, by the way, but when we looked it up, um, sure enough, it sort of had these big holes in what could be what nurses could do what they could practice and so we went back and forth for months and months and months turned into a year or a year and a half and 
they just, they weren't having any of it. You know, we were trying to get them to change the wording. We had doctors come in and testify that they, nothing was working. So we said, you know what, we're gonna, we're gonna take a different tact here. We decided to apply for a license to be a continuing education provider. And we filled out the forms and we sent it in. And after one denial, we sent it, they said, you know, you can't teach some of these things. And we said, au contraire, according to the nurse's manual, um, this is allowed. So after our brief appeal, they approved our course entitled Feng Shui for Nurses. Feng Shui for Nurses included modules that uh, were complete BS, like uh, something called mobile, mobile kinesiology. Mobile is the German word for furniture. So it was actually furniture moving was one of the modules. Uh, this, we had another module called the, it was like Shi Yu or something like that. It was the Chinese words for snake oil, which was okayed. And, and we taught another course, another module called Canopiary Flexibility. We went to all the dictionaries we could find online and looked up the word, we made up this word canopiary. It exists nowhere. And we made up this thing that it allows people to turn their heads 360 degrees. <laughs> you could be so flexible. You could So all these things were okay uh, in our course. And then um, the, our company that was teaching the course, we uh, signed up as the California Foundation for Institutional Care or CFI Care, get it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. They didn't think that was, well, they didn't, they did not think it was funny. They, it went right past them. <laughs> so everything went through. I got their certificate in the mail. It's hanging on my, it's hanging behind me on the wall. Um, we were a, an official provider. Then we made this announcement. We're going to teach it at the Steve Allen theater in our old lo location on Hollywood Boulevard. And we we're going to teach this, this course and invite nurses to get these credits, we weren't even gonna charge them for it. And we did all this publicity that basically said, can you believe what they're letting us teach? And then I got a letter in the mail saying that our license had been revoked. And when I said, when I asked them why was our license revoked, they would not respond. So <laughs> we lost our license. Um, soon after Arnold Schwarzenegger, then governor of California fired the entire board of board of directors, not because of what we were doing, because they were uh, delinquent in addressing uh, right. complaints. Um, so we were like we're having to go back to square one again, and we just we never followed through. But <laughs> there are still of course, but it took years wow. and like an unbelievable amount of research and. We went to Sacramento one time and it was just, it was just crazy. Um, <laughs> cool. Should we do one other quick? I don't, I don't know. I mean, if we're only doing an hour, then maybe we should just jump. Oh right yeah. Well, let's just go to questions. Cause yeah. we're, let me get my uh, Q and A going here. All right. Um, okay. So um, we'll just tag team on these uh, okay. questions. Um, so do you want to read? I'll uh, read the first one. Yeah. Top. Let's see. Question for Jim Underdown. Do you have a favorite point of inquiry interview that you have done? Oh boy. Um, boy, that's a tough question. I've interviewed a lot of people. We did, uh, science denial by, uh, uh, these two ladies wrote this book called Science and Al Sinatra and Hofer. Hofer. Um, that was interesting. I did a real interesting uh, Mark Boslow on uh, climate denial. He's a, a climate scientist. And I uh, interviewed my, uh, 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 my good friend, uh, Richard Wiseman in 
London, England, and uh, we talked about stuff. Those are probably my top Very cool. three. So, All right. uh, okay, this one's for you. Uh, Kenny, I enjoyed your articles in, Ghost, in the Ghost and Machine series. I see home security users claim they catch ghosts. Oh, haven't we all? People who seem transparent. Uh, will you do a video or article addressing this since it seems to be so common? That is on the list um, because yes, we do see that a lot. Uh, we see security cameras. I mean, I get security. I, today, literally I got two emails with links to security camera footage because they have something like that, a transparent person or, you know, a glowing figure or something. So yes, it, that that's on the list. Um, it, it's a very long list <laughs> and that day job gets in the way um, sometimes. So I'm working on it and uh, good to see you, Carolyn. Um, but yeah, that's definitely on the list because I think that would be fun to do. And I do have a bunch of old security cameras that I will be hooking up and then taking various videos so I can demonstrate because that's, I mean, that's how you do it. You got to show it like, look, I can do it too. Yeah. Try to use, trying to use the same camera. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. All right. Next one. Uh, what do you think of surviving death and life after death? Uh, Tyler Henry TV shows on Netflix. Yeah. Tyler, Tyler, and we know Tyler Henry out here. We've sent him a, a letter inviting him to try out for the $250,000 prize. He hasn't responded. But um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, these shows are crap. There is no life after death. I hate to be the bringer of bad news, but um, live your life now because all the science points to that once your brain dies, you, the person that is you, is gone and probably forever. And, and, and don't tell me about these stories about people falling through the ice and stuff. Your brain isn't completely dead if you fall through the ice and you're frozen and they revive you. I'm talking about Lazarus. If you're dead for three days, forget about it, it's over. So anyone who's doing stories about this, they're tapping in to our innate human desire not to die and to, to have some sort of continuance of ourselves. It's understandable why they're popular, um, but it's a load of crap. So, and, and Tyler Henry's full of crap too. <laughs> So uh, to build upon that, I see Tyler Henry, I've seen a couple of his shows, his demonstrations, and he uses a combination of cold reading and hot reading. I mean, it, it's very obvious what he's doing. And Susan Gerbic has gone into this um, in, in detail, but you also have to remember these shows have a crew. They have a full crew out there that help them. And you can do research. I mean, honestly, when you Google something, you get information right away and imagine going into a studio and you're told, Hey, you're going to meet, I don't know, Neil deGrasse Tyson. You're going to meet him. And it's just going to be like five minutes in five minutes. I can find a ton of crap on him, ton of crap. And just because he's popular and he's a celebrity doesn't mean it's different for the us little people because you can give me a name and I can usually find information on them within minutes. And if we have specifics and we have a first and last name, holy crap. Like we've done that with Susan. I had Susan on my show and interviewed her and we did, um, I did a cold reading off of her, like on screen. And then I did a hot reading on her and you couldn't tell because I was using a screen on this side and just kind of like doing this whole psychic thing out. <laughs> looking over here and I'm reading it off yeah. the screen and telling her information about herself from years ago. So imagine what you have when you have assistants all over the place and you have maybe a couple hours. Holy crap. You oh, yeah. A lot. yeah. Susan and, and Mark Edward do, do great work with all those psychics. Okay. Um, okay. This one's for you. Um, I, they didn't say it's for you, but I do. Uh, do the recently disclosed videos of UAPs from the US military prove that are extraterrestrial beings visiting the earth. You've seen those yes. airplane videos? I've seen them, yeah. And I, I delved into at least one. I did the Batman balloon video um, where it was a, a picture taken from a, a F-18 Hornet. 
Um, and the, I think the co-pilot, which was in the back, took the picture with his iPhone. Um, and looking into that article, and, and enlarging the photo um, and enhancing it as much as I could, I was able to compare it with photos of a Batman balloon, and, which I believe is the exact balloon that, that was up there. And there's always this talk about, well, it was like 30,000 feet and this and that. It couldn't have been. Keep in mind that we're only getting the information from someone. We're not even sure if it's the actual pilot that took the picture. Um, but we also don't see instruments. So we don't know if it was actually 30,000 feet or, at, or wherever. Mylar, mylar balloons can go up almost that high. Um, 20,000, 25,000. And there's actually clubs that send up those kind of balloons with trackers and it's a hobby. So it is possible that, yeah, they took a picture of a Batman balloon. So with these other uh, videos that they disclosed, like the Tic Tac video and the Go Fast video, um, I've looked at them, but I honestly, I rely heavily on Mick West. And I know a lot of the UFO community doesn't like them, but you know what? The man is thorough. The man is detailed thorough he knows his shit so watch his videos don't complain leave your biases out and then look at the numbers look at what he does and then do it replicate it and see what you come up with yeah that's yeah, the best way sure. to do it but, go to yeah, mick it, west mick west is a great uh mick west is phenomenal with that stuff yeah. um amazing what he does all right so let's see oh this question is actually directed towards you so i'm jumping out of place here i don't know how to get rid of these but let's see um jim paranormal shoes ghost hunters etc disclaimers if they exist at all are clearly disingenuous uh what are the legalities that permit these shows to be aired yeah that's an interesting question because uh one of my one of our, our former members of the iig was a camera guy on one of those shows. And he told us flat out that, you know, they would, they'd throw a, a coin down a, a stairwell or something. And, you know, then everyone would look and say, what was that? And there's no one else in the building. And so, listen, they can't just walk into these old buildings night after night after night or show after show and find absolutely nothing. So is there some funny business going on to try to stir up something? Yes. Um, and as you well know, you know, they're holding up these meters and stuff that measure all kinds of things. The meter may see an electromagnetic field somewhere. Is that a ghost? Probably not. So, you know, it's, it's tough to we've never tried to sue them or anything. Um, I mean, our policy has always more been to let people understand what's going on. And when you see a, a cold spot in the, in the wall, it's because every building in the United States practically has a cold spot somewhere. <laughs> they're not built. I, I've opened up a lot of walls in my life and they're not all the same. They're not even, you know, they're, they're, right. there are, prosaic reasons for why they're getting these readings or whatever is going on so yeah. um yeah it's probably not a legal thing but you know they're look it's it's supposed to be entertainment it's not real that's and it. that's the message from that's us. that's pretty much it it's for entertainment purposes and that's how they get away with it uh okay kenny did any of these psychics ever face legal ramifications as long as we're on the the law kick here like in the Stephanie case? So, the, no. It's like, in this case, no, they didn't. Um, but there are, it's, it's very difficult to bring a case against the psychic or, and or medium. And the best person to actually talk about that with would be, uh, um, oh, my God, I'm having a brain fart. Um, uh, I just had him on my show. Um, the well-known skeptic. Oh, Rob? Rob Palmer, yes. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, Rob, <laughs> if you're watching. Um, but he has talked to an investigator that specializes in those kind of cases to bring um, litigation against psychics that have taken people for, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, 
So actually to go after them takes a lot of money. Um, it, it takes a lot of time. And you also have to overcome the embarrassment because if you have given a, a psychic or a medium a lot of money to continue to talk to your loved one or give you uh, advice, by the time you're thousands, if not a hundred thousand or more in the hole, you're embarrassed to say anything. You don't want to tell anyone you, you spent all that money because yeah. of how people will look at you. So you keep quiet. Um, same thing happens with Scientologists, by the way, because they get the same thing. They get beat out of, you know, well into six figures and then they figure out that it's uh, a load of bull and it's like, oh, do I really want to go public with this or can we just pretend like it never happened? Right. All right. Get one for you here. Uh, typing early in the program, John Edwards' methods have been discredited by several sources, including Skeptical Inquirer. Why doesn't he seem to get criminally charged? Uh, Bernie Madoff died in prison. Why doesn't it seem like this will happen to Edward? <laughs> Uh, you know, part of the problem is the people who go to see John Edward believe that he's being successful. So, um, you know, part of what you were talking about, like, you know, with either you spend the money and you're embarrassed, you get burned, or you think he actually did talk to your uncle Tanutz or whoever. And, you know, he, I don't have standing because I didn't lose any money from him. You have to be the person who actually got taken to uh, be the one who sues. And it's pretty rare, you know, unless you got beat out of tons of money, it's pretty rare for someone to bring up, bring the case forward. Yeah. So, yeah. Cool. Um, we got a lot of questions. Hold yeah, on. a lot of psychics. Uh, how do I teach my granddaughter? This is for you because you're, you're nicer than I am. <laughs> How do I teach my granddaughter to be skeptical and to use critical thinking, which my daughter lacks? Ah, patience. <laughs> Lots of patience. Honestly, I mean, that's the best course of action. Talk to them. Have conversations. Don't try to lecture them. Don't try to drill it into them or pound it into them like, you know, like our parents used to do to us. Like, you're doing this because I said so. That doesn't work. As the, the older people get, the more rebellious, they go through the rebel phase and then they start thinking on their own. They want to have their own ideas. So if you try to force your ideas onto them, it's not going to work. You're going to get pushed back. So take your time. Uh, you know, it's one of the things that I try to do, if somebody comes to me and, and says, you know, like this set of circumstances, definitely it's a ghost. It has to be a ghost. My first question will always be, well, depending on the situation, if, if I'm being confrontational because they're being an ass, I mean, I'm like, how do you know that? How do you know that? <laughs> Give it to me. But otherwise, it's okay. Let's, let's put the ghost explanation aside. Let's, let's table that for a second here. What else in your mind could make this happen? What could cause that shadow? What could cause that noise? Let's explore that and give me some ideas. And now you're pushing it back onto them, but you're not being confrontational. You're, you're exploring other ideas. And then you can make a list and say, all right, you know, ghosts, we don't know much about ghosts. We see a lot of TV shows. Yeah, it's entertainment. People have ideas. Okay. But this shadow, there is a road outside that comes up. There's a lot of traffic comes by. That open window, light comes in there. Man, you know, that could cause a shadow. Why? Let's go try it. Let's go try it. And then jump in the car with them. Because that gets them involved and it gets hands on. And, and I mean, I think that's the best way to, to start teaching critical thinking, to not only bring it up, but to do it, to actively do it. Yeah. So great. there's my answer. Hope that helped. Um, well, should we do one more quick one? Oh, my goodness. There's so many. I want to get to all of them. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, let me see if there's one directly for you, because some people were coming out and saying yeah let's see no that's psychics um oh this is a good one. Oh, this was highlighted so let's let's address this one if we're going to do one last one have either of you ever been sued by the persons you were investigating nah. how did you address any lawsuits that were brought against you and or what was the outcome 
So you go first. Um, we were, we've been threatened to be sued multiple times. The best one was we, a bunch of us went to a spoon bender class in Los Angeles and we wrote this whole thing. It's a long story about it, but she, she was basically teaching people how to bend spoons by cranking the, it over with their hands, which didn't seem right to us. So we wrote the whole thing up. The lawyer called me up and he says, you know, you said some things about my client and I'm afraid we're going to have to go to court about this. And I said, oh, that would be excellent. Please take us to court because I'm going to ask your client in front of the judge or jury to bend a spoon with her mind in front of all those people. I'll have the press there. It's going to be a great day. Make this happen as soon as possible. And I never heard from him again. Oh. So likewise, I've been threatened many, many, many times um, because I do actively go, go after people. Um, and it's not like I go after them. Sometimes they say something and it, it piques my interest. Like, oh, uh, one example, I wrote an article about a gentleman who said that he worked on a murder case, a cold case that, and this is, this is the trigger here, that had to be specially reopened by the attorney general so I could work on it. And I was like, that's not right. That's, <laughs> that's not right. Um, now I'm interested. Tell me more. <laughs> and we, we had a conversation. I was trying to get information. I found out that he, he had all this claim that he had worked on a murder case. He never did. I, I talked to the detective in charge of the case and he's like, nope, never heard of him. He's never been part of the case, never touched base with nothing. Um, so there was more information, but I wrote about him. There's, a, there's another article coming out soon, look for it, <laughs> about another psychic, um, specifically like a lot of claims that they made. But yeah, I've been, it's, I've been threatened, but nothing has ever gone through. Um, and I cover myself because I do talk, what, we have a, a legal guy um, at, at Skeptical Choir, so I run things through him first, um, make sure I'm okay. I mean, it doesn't mean I'm, uh, you know, immune, but it still makes sure I cover all my bases. Um, and I'm, I make sure I back up what I say. If I'm going, going to accuse you of something or say, no, you said this and it's not true, I damn well better have something to back that up. So I will never include something in an article or a video that I say where I don't have something to back it up. Yeah, our, our legal counsel, Nick, has shut us down a few times. There was a guy in, uh, in Germany who said he had the psychic power to stop a bullet from hitting someone. And I said, come on, let's test it. We'll put a, something in front of him. I'm not sure what. Can't can we at least do a BB gun? <laughs> And uh, yeah, so yeah, he told me all about that. <laughs> all right, I think we're out of time. Uh, Kenny Biddle, thanks so much for being on. Uh, look for Kenny in the Skeptical Inquirer every issue and in his Ghosts in the Machine series. Where else can they? What's your, your uh, twice weekly stream? Oh, so Friday nights at 8 p.m. I, Eastern Time, I do a show called The Skeptical Help Bar. And it's uh, YouTube and Facebook. You look for I am Kenny Biddle or Skeptical Help Bar. It's, it's on there. And uh, basically, it's like a bar environment. You know, I have a guest on once in a while. It's just me, Q&A. We all drink. We have fun. We learn stuff together. I look stuff up. We learn it. And, and we have fun. Um, Saturday nights at 8 p.m., I do another show called Three Tortured Souls with uh, Tim Vickers and Dave Schumacher. And we usually pick one one topic that has some kind of paranormal link to it and we discuss it we research it and we discuss it we give three different perspectives um like two weeks ago we did the history of witchcraft and it wasn't like spooky i'm going to cast spells it was actual the hi actual history of witchcraft up until the salem witch trials so really fun stuff and uh so that's my two shows that i do and uh, everything else that i do with you so what do you do what do you got yeah, um, occasionally I'll write a column on our uh, blogs, either Hollywood Reality Check or Ask the Atheist, and um, also hosting uh, Point of Inquiry, our flagship podcast. And coming up, we're starting a new web series called Skeptolab. Uh -oh. The bunk stops here. 
So uh, watch for that in the future. It's a teaser. That's all I'm going to tell you. Um, cool. But thanks, uh, thanks for coming on, and uh, thanks everyone. Thanks Mike and Alice for helping out with the tech, and uh, everyone else for tuning in. And uh, we hope to see you next time on Skeptical Inquirer Presents. Yay!